Amen. Open your Bibles to Colossians 3.16 if you would. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16. Lord, thank you for this time we can spend together. We thank you for your word. We thank you for its truthfulness. We pray that we would submit ourselves to it and be instructed by it. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. I want to start with the first phrase of that verse. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Get with me Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 6. Deuteronomy 6, 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 6. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates." Now what Deuteronomy 6 is, is telling us, I think, is this. When God gives his word to Israel, notice what he tells them to do. The words that he commands them in verse 6, they're supposed to be in their heart. And then when you read verse 7, they're supposed to teach them diligently to thy children in every situation. In thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up. Then you're supposed to bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and as frontlets between thine eyes, write them on the posts of thy house and on thy gates. The point of Deuteronomy 6 is that the command to Israel was to make the Word of God ever present in their life. It's to be spatially throughout their house, to be on their gates, and how often were they to talk about it? Constantly, right? When thou liest down, when thou risest up, when you're journeying, and so on. Get with me Psalm 119, verse 11. The Word of God tells us that the Word of God should be ever-present in our life, in our thinking, in our activities. Psalm 119, verse 11. Thy Word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. We talked earlier this morning about the inward man and how the inward man is at variance with the flesh. Well, what does the flesh want to do? The flesh wants to sin. The inner man doesn't want to do that. There's a conflict between them. The Word of God is empowering to the inner man. Thy word have I hid in my heart, and what is the natural consequence of that? You're less likely to sin. The more that the Word of God is present in your thinking, the better off you will be spiritually. So, you're familiar with Proverbs, where it says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. That's, that's what you really are, isn't it? The, the, the way you think in your inner man is what you really are. I'll give you a simple example. Have you ever had a conversation with someone where you're polite and nice, but you're thinking, this person's an idiot. <laughs> now, you know you've had that. You may be thinking that right now. <laughs> Your inner man is what you really think. In fact, truthfully, part of the process of going from being a child to an adult is you learn to not say what you think. Right? Because you learn, if I just tell people exactly what's on my mind, it's not going to be something they receive. Well. <laughs> so you learn not to do that. But the way you think in your inner man is really how you are. Isn't that true? The other thing that's true is every sin you commit with the body 
You first decided to do it in your inner man. You never punched anyone in the nose before. Inwardly, you decided, I'm going to punch that guy in the nose, right? <laughs> because your inner man, we are marionettes. We're puppets, right? The body does what the inner man commands it to do. My point being this, it's the battles of life are internal. People today often, they're interested in their victimhood and how circumstances have pressed upon them. Life is much less about the external things, and it's more about how you choose to react to them, isn't it? Yeah. You control your attitude. You control your response. Go back with me to get, go with me to Ephesians chapter five. What I'm just trying to stress to you there is that the issues of life are internal, and if you want victory in those issues, what do you need to do? You need to have the Word of God dwelling inside you because it's, what's in, it's what empowers you to have victory. So get Ephesians 5, verse 18, and get Colossians 3, 16. We're going to look at this the same time. This is something that uh, I learned in, in Grace School of the Bible many years ago from something that Rick was teaching, and I want to <coughs> share this with you in case you haven't seen it. If we look at Ephesians 5.18, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now if you notice that psalms and hymns and spiritual songs phraseology, that phrase only occurs elsewhere in Colossians 3.16. Look at Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and, and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. The Bible teaches you often through cross-references, meaning you're looking at a particular verse. How do I understand what this verse means? You find another verse that explains it. 1 Corinthians 2.13 calls that comparing spiritual things with spiritual. When you see an extended phrase like psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, and you see that in two different verses, the first thing that you should do as a matter of Bible study is lay those verses next to each other because there's going to be some parallelism, some commonality between those verses. So if we do that, look at Colossians 3.16. Right before the, the phrase, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, we see the following phrase, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Now go to Ephesians 5. Verse 19 says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, let's look what's right before it, just as we did in Colossians 3.16. And it says, and be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So what I'm going to suggest to you is be filled with the Spirit corresponds to let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Here's why that matters. Too much of modern Christendom, of modern churchianity, is experiential-based emotionalism. Right? It, it's my experience, it's what I felt. The spiritual life is manifested either by some charismatic gift or by song or activity. What those verses suggest is truly being filled with the Spirit is the Word of Christ dwelling in you richly. The Spirit-filled life is not connected to emotion or experience, it's connected to to the Word of God. Years ago, I shouldn't confess this, but here we go. Years ago, before I was a dispensationalist, when I was newly saved, I, I attended a charismatic church. And I did that because I couldn't see why not to. Right? If, if the Bible is true, and there are things going on in, in Acts 2, why wouldn't those be going on today? And uh, actually, one of the things that happened, the preacher got up one day, and he was talking about, he was teaching in Revelations, 
And he told the congregation the name that was written on the stone that no man knoweth. And I thought, well, I don't know much, but i got to find some other place to be. Because if the verse says, no man knoweth, I doubt that he told this guy in North Carolina. I mean, it just didn't make any sense. But while I was going through that phase, I had someone say to me, a man with an experience is never at a loss to a man with an argument. And what he was saying was, look, I've, I've had this experience. I've felt the Spirit do something, or I spoke in tongues, or I, you know, I did something or other. And I know what I felt. So whatever you try to convince me of, using logic and reason and verses, I have my experience. And, and that was exactly how it operated. In other words, it was, ex it was determining truth by virtue of experience. Look with me at 2 Peter chapter 1. Now when he says something like that, by the way, it's an argument you can't win. Right? Because he's had his experience, you weren't there, how can you tell him what he experienced? Well, look with me at 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. Now, fables are stories. They're, they're, they're fake stories. And, of course, that's what is, is common today. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. What event is Peter referring to there in those verses? The Mount of Transfiguration, right? When they're in the holy mount. He says in verse 16, they're eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now, if you were going by experience, that's maybe one of the most profound experiences in human history, right? They're on the Mount of Transfiguration. They're with Jesus Christ. They see him in his transfigured glory. And it's not even all the 12, right? It's just three of them. So as far as experiences go, that's a pretty big deal, and it's certainly bigger than any experience in the last 1,500 years. Read verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. What Peter says in verse 19 Someone who was an eyewitness of the Lord's glory on the Mount of Transfiguration, he says the written word is better. Right? It's more sure. Have you ever had an experience where your recollection of it was inaccurate? <laughs> or where later on you couldn't remember it properly? And, and that, that experience is it, it's weak and flimsy in that sense, right? You could forget it, you could misremember details. When you actually have an authoritative written record, it is superior, especially if it's been divinely preserved. Now, I say that all to say that what this means is that the Word of God needs to be our authority, not experience, not emotion, not fables. Look with me at Romans 10, verse 17. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And have any of you ever heard a preacher stand up and say something along the lines of the following? We have a new building campaign. And we're going to build a $2 million building. And we have $37 in the bank. 
But we're stepping out in faith. Right? And we are trusting God to build this building. We can't build this building with our own hands. Our own hands are too frail. But we're trusting God. <laughs> right? And that has not a thing to do with faith. Amen. Right? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, which means all true faith originates where? The Word of God. The Word of God. And so when Proverbs, for example, warns you about debt, you are unscriptural when you say, we're going to do this thing for which we have no reasonable financial plan. That's not acting in faith. That's you decided what you want to do, and now it's God's responsibility to somehow make what you want to happen. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yes. And if he doesn't, then he failed you. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So this is all to say this. All true faith originates from the Word of God. Yes. The Spirit-filled life is based upon the Word of God. Letting the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. And all the modern excitement and focus on things other than the Word of God is a fake spirituality. Amen. It's a spirituality with no power, and it's a spirituality with no ultimate substance. Now you can decide if this is true or not. Charismaticism produces emotional burnout. And the reason why it does that is if you have all this emotion and energy and activity that's not based upon an authentic source, you just get tired of it. Yeah. Right? It's emotionally draining to operate in that emotional cyclicality. What you're what you much you're much more better off doing, what you're far better off doing, is plugging into the Word of God and building a foundation. Get with me. Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. And we'll look at verse 8. Joshua 1 verse 8. The book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then shalt thou have good success. Get Psalm 119.99. Psalm 119 and 99. Psalm 119.99. I have more understanding than all my teachers for thy testimonies are my meditation. You can see what those verses are talking about. There's a bunch of other verses we could look at. But the idea is the Word of God should be ever-present in our thoughts. We should be meditating on it. We should be dwelling on it. Get with me 1 Timothy 6, verse 17. I, I want to show you a contrast. So while you're turning there, I'm going to read to you the first part of Colossians 3.16. It says, Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Compare that with 1 Timothy 6.17. Charge them that are rich, this is a different rich, that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Verse 18. That they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. Verse 19, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. If you go talk to the next 10 people you bump into, including saved people, and you ask them what it means to be rich, how are they going to answer that? They're going to answer that in worldly terms, right? They're going to answer that in worldly financial success and comfort. The Bible talks about richness, but it talks about it in a way that it's eternal. 
in terms of being rich in good works, laying up store for themselves against the time to come. So let me give you this analogy. Let's say that uh, you're playing Monopoly, and let's say that you're winning. And so you have all this money, and you're a millionaire in this Monopoly money. And what happens after the game ends? Well, it's all play money. It's not meaningful because you can't take it with you, right? It was just, it was just a temporary charade. That's what worldly wealth is, right? Right. You have it while you're here, and I won't call this life a game, but is it limited in time? Yes. And is it the real experience that we were meant for? No. And what happens is the world chases monopoly money in the form of dollars and gold and I guess now Bitcoin. <laughs> and it doesn't mean anything in the next life, does it? And so people end up spiritually impoverished. Colossians 3.16 then says this, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. The purpose of music is to teach. That's its purpose. And the reason why music is such a good teacher, you've had this happen, have you ever heard a song on the radio or heard someone sing it and then you can't get the song out of your mind? Yeah. And, and the reason why is that when the lyrics correspond to a catchy melody and it's tight, you can't get it out of your mind. The reason why you can remember some songs better than Bible verses is because you remember the tune, right? Well, music is very effective at teaching because it's memorable then, right? Rock of ages, clap for me, and so on. The purpose of music is to teach. Most secular songs either teach evil or are nonsensical. Isn't that true? Most of them, well, many of them just flat out teach evil, right? They just teach things that are wrong. The ones that don't teach things are wrong often don't even make any sense. And you've, you've, you've no doubt aware of this. Many times what happens is the songwriters write the lyrics so the lyrics match the melody, even if they don't make any sense. And they're open about that. They just want it to sound proper. Well, that is an abuse. It, it's a misuse of the gift of music. What happens today is that many of the most talented musicians waste their talents. Instead of making music that could be memorable, teaching sound doctrine, they make music that just teaches nonsense or silly things. Look with me at Ephesians 5.19. <clears throat> Speaking to yourselves, notice that, to yourselves, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Not all singing is public singing. Some of it is to yourself. Singing and making melody in your heart. Look with me at James 5, verse 13. James chapter 5 and verse 13. James 5, 13. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Happiness or merriment should be reflected in singing God's word. So let me give you this test. If you do not spontaneously sing some sort of psalm or hymn or spiritual song, then the word of Christ is not dwelling in you richly. Isn't that what Colossians 3.16 is talking about? So, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. The cross-reference to that is singing and making melody in your heart. What we should be doing is, one of the reasons it's good to sing hymns and learn them and memorize them is, you can then sing them throughout the week. The, uh, the, the test, I mean, I'll take this for what it's worth, 
I think one of the tests of spirituality is whether or not you have God's music dwelling in your heart. And, and that's why my encouragement would be make it a point to hum and sing spiritual songs. It will do wonders for your mental, uh, mental state, your frame of mind. Go back with me to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, and we'll look at verse 17. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Get 1 Corinthians 10, 31. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and verse 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Get 1 Corinthians 6, 19. First Corinthians six nineteen. What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. That verse tells us that we're bought with a price. Which that what that means is that our time, our talent, our treasure, our energy, our efforts should be devoted to the Lord. And the idea there is simple. Christ died for our sins on the cross. He redeemed us. How should we live out of gratitude? We should live in a way where each moment all of our energy is directed to pleasing Him. Now Colossians 3.17 then says this, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Yet 1 Thessalonians 5.18 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So point number one, it says in everything. In every circumstance, in every situation of life, what should we be doing? Giving thanks. Do we sometimes feel sorry for ourselves? Are we sometimes upset with God for what He's allowed to happen to us? The scriptural approach is in everything, give thanks. And here, here's how I think about that. I was on my way to a lake of fire that I richly deserved. And I was going to spend eternity there. And it was going to be real, real, real bad. Right? God gave me eternal life as a free gift. If the rest of my life is spent in poor health, bankruptcy, and prison, hallelujah. Right? I mean, he's given me so much. Right? I'm blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. I'm accepted in the beloved. I'm complete in him. There's no reason for me to be bent out of shape or bothered by some earthly minutia, bankruptcy, a bad diagnosis, whatever, how long does it last? Right? Just for a moment, and I have eternal blessedness in heavenly places. That's why I think it says in everything, give thanks. It doesn't say give thanks, you know, for every bad thing that happens. It says in everything. Right? right? So, so I can be thankful in the midst of all of that. And in fact, that's God's will for my life. We are spiritual billionaires that whine and moan because of earthly inconvenience. Right? Yeah. We're just too easily bothered. Now, I have another observation about this verse when it says, in, in everything give thanks. Some of you have probably noticed this. In sort of pop psychology and... Um, like business literature, there's an emphasis on gratitude. And what, what, what folks are doing, there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of material written about how do you keep people happy at work, how do you keep them in a, a positive mental state so they can be productive. 
And one of the things that's been common in recent years is a focus on gratitude. And what they tell people to do is think of things that you're thankful for, or identify things that you're grateful about. What they're doing when they do that is they're taking a scriptural truth that works, and they're trying to apply it outside of that context, and so it accomplishes, I would say, something. Because if you take a scriptural truth and you apply it, there's a benefit to it. But they're failing to get the full benefit of it, of course, because you need to be in Christ Jesus to really have the things that you need to be grateful about, right? Right. Look with me at Ephesians 5, verse 20. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father, notice, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have an awful lot to be thankful about. And the reason why I think it says in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ is he's the one that purchased it all for us. Right? Without him, we would have nothing. Get with me Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. And this passage is my, my personal favorite passage on prayer. Be careful for nothing. So in other words, don't be full of care. Don't be overwhelmed about circumstances. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, in every situation, in every trial, in every circumstance, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. So let's put that verse together. Be careful for nothing, don't be overwhelmed, but in everything, in every situation you find yourself, how are you to respond? Well, it says that you're to respond there by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known. I don't know if you watch preachers on TV, hopefully you don't. But there's this whole school of prayer where what happens is you command God to do things. I don't know if you've noticed this or not. And you give God orders and he's just supposed to do them. The scriptural word is request. It's not a command, it's a request. And it's a request made with thanksgiving. Here's why that matters. Do you ever face circumstances in life that are overwhelming? Or do you ever face problems where you think about it and <coughs> you don't know what to do? Right? It, it, it's too big, it's too challenging. So what should you do in that instance? The answer to that, well, be careful for nothing, so don't be overwhelmed by it. But what I need to do is I need to make my request known unto God. I can pray about it. And I can ask God for his help with it. And I do so, this is important, with an attitude of thanksgiving. Take the biggest problem in your life, whatever it is. That problem pales in comparison to who you are in Christ. So when I make this request, should I be, God, you need to fix this. <laughs> How could you let this happen to me? Should, should I have an attitude like that about it? Or should I have an attitude along the lines of, I am so thankful for what you've given me in Christ. Thank you, Lord. I have an additional need. I have a problem here that's too big for me. And I'm sure, and I suspect you have them. I have them. I have situations where I don't know what to do with it. It's a mess, and I don't see how to fix the problem from an earthly perspective. So what do I do? I pray about it. I let my request be made known unto God. Now look at verse 7. <laughs> and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. What I've essentially done is I've taken this problem that's too big for me. Here you go. God can do something about it. I cannot. 
Once I put it into his hands, I can have the peace of knowing I've dealt with this the way that I should. I've given it to God. If God wants it fixed, hallelujah. And if it stays the same, hallelujah. Right? Either way, in the end, we're going to win. And I think that's a helpful way to think about the problems of life. There are going to be things that we can't solve, so we can pray about them. God, I'm giving this to you. But I'm giving it to you with an attitude of thanks, thankfulness. Because I know what you've done for me. I know you love me. You, you love me more than I love myself, crazily enough, right? So if I give it to you, I can be confident that however you handle it will be fine. And, and, and by the way, sometimes the way he handles it, uh, I've thought about Paul's thorn a little bit. When, when Paul has his thorn, the messenger of Satan that buffets him, put, your shoes, put, put yourself in his shoes for a minute. Well, God, you gave me the dispensation of grace. It was a mystery. Everyone thinks I'm wackadoodle. <laughs> Because it's right, it's, it's different content. Who's who, who's Paul? Yeah, God gave you a revelation, right? So I'm going around preaching this, and there's a messenger of Satan that's buffeting me the whole time. You can decide for yourself. Here's what I tend to think that was. When the thorn in the flesh is described as a messenger of Satan, I suspect it was a messenger of Satan. I mean, I suspect it was someone with a message. What I suspect happened was this. You can decide. If you're Satan and you want to destroy the work that Paul is doing, what you do is you have your own messenger and he follows Paul on his journeys one city behind. So let him leave Galatia so he's no longer there. Go in there and teach him the law. Doesn't Paul say in Galatians 1.6, I marvel that ye are so soon removed. How'd they get so soon removed? Someone had to teach them otherwise. Okay? So imagine you're Paul, and you say to God, look, under the kingdom program, there were 12 guys that shared the load. You gave me all of it. And oh, by the way, you've given me all of it, but as of right now, how many written scriptures are there that contain the revelation of the mystery? None until I write them. So I have to tell people, yeah, God appeared to me and he told me this. And they're like, yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> and then when I go to a place and I finally establish a church, you know what happens? I leave there and this guy tears it apart. And he keeps doing it. So Paul's request is not a purely selfish request. Saying, God, make, make him quit. He's destroying the work. And how did God respond? My grace is sufficient. So sometimes what happens is that you have the problem, and the problem doesn't go away. But you experience God's grace in a deeper way. Right? And that's why Paul said he gloried that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And one of the things that happens in this life, just being honest, is that some of the trials and tribulations we have are not going to go away. And they're not going to get better in an earthly sense. But what that means is God's grace will dwell upon us more richly. It'll be stronger. And that's the way to, to, to think about it, I think. Look with me at Romans chapter 1, verse 8. Now, the, the latter part of Colossians 3.17 talks about giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Romans 1, verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ. I'm going to just read these to you. Romans 7.25. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the idea there is we give thanks by Christ because He made it all purposeful. Possible. Colossians 3.18. So Alan had the tough verse on husbands, and I get the verse on wives. And if I'd known better, I'd have traded it. <laughs> but look with me at Colossians 3.18. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. 
Compare that with Ephesians 5.22. Ephesians 5.22. Ephesians 5.22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. <coughs> now, I don't need to tell you that those are controversial verses, and that people don't like those. And, of course, the other thing that happens is when a man teaches on those verses, the response always is, well, yeah, sure, you can teach on this verse because it doesn't apply to you, right? And, and that's, you know, how people sometimes think about that. And so I just want to give you a couple of thoughts on that. The, the first is, is this. The verse says what it says, and the preacher is irrelevant, right? That's right. So the preacher is just, his job... The preacher's job is not, it shouldn't be an exercise in creative writing. It's not the idea not to make up or come up with something new. It's just to relay what the, what the verses say. And so let me, with that, let me give you a couple thoughts. The first thing is, notice, I'm just going to reread this again. Colossians 3.18. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. So the first thing to notice is that what the verse is specifically talking about is the wife's duty of submission is not to male, males in general, it's simply to her own husband. The second thing to notice, Colossians 3.18, I'm going to read it again. It says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. So the, the verses do not teach total submission. I know that there are some preachers that will preach this in the sense of total submission, so whatever the husband says, the wife has to do. That's not the scriptural guidance at all. It says, as it is fit in the Lord. So let me give you a practical example. Husband says, honey, I need your help. I need you to drive the getaway car. <laughs> and just, I'll be out in five minutes, so have the engine running and be ready to go. Do you need to submit to that? Well, that's not fit in the Lord, so I would say no. So that's kind of lighthearted. But Scripture is teaching submission only as it is fit in the Lord. Look with me at Acts 5.29. Acts chapter 5. In verse 29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. What was happening in Acts 5 is that Peter and the other apostles were instructed not to preach in the name of the Lord. And they were instructed that by the secular authorities. And what Peter responded to them is simply to say, we ought to obey God rather than man. So in other words, if, if you want to make traffic laws, that's fine. We'll obey those. But if you're going to make a law that directly contradicts the guidance of Scripture, then we can't obey. And so the same concept here where wives submit to your own husbands, it's only as it is fit in the Lord. So anything that would be contrary to that wouldn't be something that, that would uh, require submission. Now go get, get with me Ephesians chapter 5. For Colossians 3.18, the cross-reference is Ephesians 5.22. So look at Ephesians 5.22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now I'm going to show you an advanced study trick that almost no one uses. Are you ready? I'm going to read the prior verse. So look at verse 21. No, I mean, people just ignore these things. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Ephesians 5.22, where it talks about the wives' duty to submit, is right after a verse that is a general obligation of everyone. Right? right? Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. So let me use this as context. You ready? I submit to the federal government, the state government, local government, my company, my boss, my clients, my homeowners association, 
traffic signs, stoplights, rules regarding the right of way, the checkout line at Walmart, and the law of gravity. And if you don't submit to those things, you're making a mistake. Right? I mean, if you didn't follow those things, what would life be? What would it be if people had decided, I'm just not going to ignore stop signs? I, this, is, this is a funny story. Oh, yeah, well. <laughs> Lore has it that an old lawyer in my hometown uh, started driving before driver's license were issued, and so he viewed himself as grandfathered in from having to obey the new traffic laws. <laughs> and he would just, you know, drive the way he wanted to drive. Well, imagine what happens if you just ignore traffic signals, right? Get with me 1 Peter 2, verse 13. First Peter chapter 2, verse 13. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of them that do well. And my point just being that there are structures on earth that God has created, and if you choose not to submit to them, your life is going to be chaos. In other words, sometimes when submission is discussed, people immediately think of, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. The duty to submit is far broader than that. It pertains to all areas of life, and every human being that is a reasonable person submits to authority all the time. I'm going to draw something for you. I want you to tell me, I'll draw it, and then you tell me what Bible verse this is. Do you know what that is, by the way? <laughs> Okay, don't tread on me. So what is, what? that's the Gadsden flag, right? Yeah. It's most known for what historical event? Revolutionary War, right? And it was popular among the colonists, right? It was, it was with regard to Britain. You can't tread on us, and if you do, what will happen? We'll bite you. What Bible verse does that resemble? Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. And look with me at verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee. Let, let's read verse 14 to get the context. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. The Lord is clearly addressing Satan in verse 14, and he calls him the serpent. I don't personally think that Satan in the garden resembled a snake. I don't believe that for right. a minute. But the serpent is a description of his spiritual character. Okay? Right. And him going on the belly all the days of his life is a description of his subjection. Okay? Mm -hmm. of, of, of the judgment upon him. Look with me at verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed it, that's her seed, the seed of the woman, shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So what does verse 15 describe? If the serpent bruises his heel, but the seed of the woman 
bruises the serpent's head. What is the picture that's being described? Well, it's the picture of the seed of the woman, the son of man, doing what? With his foot, crushing the head of the serpent. But in so doing, the serpent bites him in the heel. Who got the better of that exchange? Obviously, the seed of the woman, right? Because if your head... You can suffer an injury to your foot better than you can suffer an injury to your head, right? <laughs> Obviously. Now, by the way, for example, guess where the story of Achilles must originate from? <laughs> Achilles is only vulnerable in one place. Which is it? Yeah. His heel. Now, by the way, when, when, Satan, when Satan niffs at Jesus Christ's heel, Jesus Christ suffers no meaningful harm. Okay, let's just be clear on that. But here's what I want you to notice. When the colonists create that flag, don't tread on me. me. Who's the me, and who are they identifying with? Six. The me is this, right. Right? right? And what that is, is that's the threat. It, that's a threat, right? Don't mess with the bully, you get the horns, right? <laughs> don't tread on me, or I'll bite you. Now, I say all that to say, this attitude is an attitude of rebellion. You can make your own political judgments whether you agree with any of this or not. This attitude is the attitude of rebellion, and it's the attitude of identifying with Satan in Genesis 3.15. I tell you all that to say this. This is my observation. You decide for yourself. There is something about us as Americans that we have a heritage of don't tread on me, right? And there's times where we look at overreach and we say, you don't want to do this, right? Decide in your life if you're going to go by history and patriotism or the Word of God. They may not be the same. What Scripture teaches is submission to lawful authority. And let me, get with me 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3. I, I want to, in, in the remaining time, I want to talk a little bit about just submission in general. So look with me at 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. So when you're in Colossians 3.18 and Ephesians 5, and it talks about wives submitting unto your husbands, the wife has a duty to submit unto the husband as it is fit in the Lord. What does the husband have a duty to do? Well, the head of every man is Christ. So what the, the, the proper Christian man should be doing is living a life of submission to the lawful authority of Jesus Christ. Right? right? <laughs> Meaning, he must also, therefore, obey everything Scripture says about how to treat his wife. Right. So is the man, then, in a position of submission? Yes. And the answer is he ought to be if he's following the Scriptures. When, whenever anyone, man or woman chooses not to submit to lawful authority, you create problems in your own life. Because there's a way God has designed for society and the universe to operate, and if you decide, I'm going to operate differently, the universe isn't going to change to fit you. Right? You're just going to run contrary to the way that God has designed things. The simple example is this. I read the owner's manual for my car, and it says, only put in unleaded fuel. And I decide, who are you to tell me what to put into my car? And I'm going to use carrot juice. Or, or whatever. Because I'm an American, I'll do what I want. Well, okay. Do what you want. But don't be surprised when you get bad results. What's the owner's manual for this universe? It's this book. And if you decide, well, I'm not going to live according to that old patriarchal, traditional book. I'm going to do what I want. Do what you want. 
It's not going to change the way God's designed the universe. Right. Look at me at Romans 13, verse 1. Romans 13, verse 1. Romans 13, verse 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. What was the most significant higher power in an earthly sense in Paul's life at that time? The Roman government, right? And he's writing to Romans. <clears throat> Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Now notice verse 3. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Will thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. Now Paul's writing that about the government that is shortly going to do what? It's going to put him to death. Right? That's how the story ends. And, and what Paul says here is, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. People sometimes have the attitude, I don't have to submit to the government, because the government's doing evil things. Well, Paul submitted to a government that was going to put him to death for no real reason. Right? And the, the authoritative words of Scripture teach submission to it. Romans 13, verse 4, For he is the minister of God to thee for good, but if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, or avenger, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Now notice verse 5. Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. Now, I don't believe Paul was dumb. I think Paul fully knew what happened to the Old Testament prophets. What happened to the Old Testament prophets? They were stoned. They were put to death. Is Paul... I, I personally don't think Paul was naive about what was going to happen to him. And yet he writes that he needed to submit to the higher powers for conscience sake. What he was going to do is he was going to submit to the higher powers full well aware that they were likely going to kill him at some point, and he did that because he wanted to have a clear conscience before God. In other words, God, if you allow the, the, the powers that be to kill me, so be it. I can live with that. But I'm not going to act contrary to your word. You've created this power structure. I'm going to submit to it. And how it plays out, it plays out. But I'm going to obey your word. Look at me at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, verse 2, for kings and for all that are in authority. When Scripture commands us to pray for kings and all those that are in authority, it's often praying for those that are contrary to us. Yes? It is. Why does it say that? That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. It doesn't say there to rebel against the government. It says to pray for, pray for them. Why? That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life. This is my personal observation. Is anyone here familiar with the outdoor code? Leave, leave the place better than you found it. When you're out camping, should you leave trash everywhere? No. no. You should clean up everything you did, and what you should actually do is leave it a little better than you found it, right? Yes. And that's the right way to do things. And what I trust each generation wants to do is they want to leave to their posterity at least a good as a republic as what you inherited, right? What you wouldn't want to do is you wouldn't want to leave to the next generation a country that is less free, that is less than what you enjoy. I don't want to do that. But you know what the problem is? 
When in 2 Timothy 4, Paul says, In the last days perilous times shall come, am I or you going to be able to thwart or reverse the natural course of this world? No. You're not going to be able to. No. Now, there's, there's a segment of political Christendom that thinks they're going to take back these power structures and then they'll operate for the glory of God. Listen, that's not, there's no, that's not going to happen. Doesn't matter what you do, the beast is going to show up at the exact time that God determined he would show up. Right? You can't change that. My point is this. We sometimes get caught up in, as I look out at the power structures that exist, I need to do something to change this. You're not ultimately going to prevent what from that which is prophesied from happening. You can't. But what we can do is this. We can lead a quiet and peaceable life and pluck firebrands from the fire. That's what we really need to be doing. Even if you fixed, what if you did this? What if you, through political activism, you finally got both parties to line up with the King James Bible? Now listen, that's not going to happen. But let's, let, let's say you did. If none of them got saved, you wouldn't actually be making much of a difference. Right? Let's say you converted everyone to your political persuasion of thinking, but you, they didn't believe the gospel. Well, great. They, need a, they lead a nice political life here on earth, and then they go to the lake of fire. We should not confuse our ambassadorship with our political preferences. The two things are very different. So I'll just close with this thought. When you think about submission, there are structures God has created. We all need to submit according to what Scripture tells us. That's the way that is the most spiritually beneficial way to live. And what we then really need to do is we need to use our time and energy for the proclamation of the truth. The things that matter are the teaching of the gospel of grace, the teaching of the scriptures rightly divided, the proclamation of the authority of the King James Bible. Those are the things that will actually make a difference in people's lives. Let me close there. Lord, thank you for this time we could spend together. We thank you for the truth of your word. We give you all the glory in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.